head off to destroy you? I don't know who would see the vicar of Christ coming at them like that and say, here comes Jesus. And Luther called, Luther called Julius II a butcher, which he was. But Luther knew where his bread was buttered too. Because he wrote, remember, Luther was defended against the Catholic Church by the, by the uh, princes of northern Germany. They were his protection. And he wrote, because the, at that time there was a peasant revolution of massive scales going on, he said, it is easier for a prince today to go to heaven killing a peasant than by prayer. But it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it's a disgrace, and it's evil, and it's untrue, and it just isn't the gospel. But it's the predominant consciousness of Christians worldwide today, by far, 98%, 95%. Makes no difference what level of church you're talking about. Popes, bishops, cardinals, lay people, ministers, I mean, it's just the predominant consciousness. But that's the history of how we got to where we are. What else did you? World War II. What's that? World War, II. World War II. Oh, yeah. Well, well, I guess the first thing to note about, about um, World War II is if you're a conservative Catholic, and even if you're I mean, a conservative Christian, even if you're not a conservative Christian, if you're a liberal Christian, or a liberal patriot of the United States, or, or, or a, 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 a conservative patriot of the United States. There's this very conservative Catholic guy, worked for Reagan, worked for Nixon, wrote for the New York Times, still very on television all the time, giving the conservative view of things, Pat Buchanan. Pat Buchanan published a book last year. called The Unnecessary War, footnoted in the extreme. The Unnecessary War, World War II. The title, The Unnecessary War, comes from a memo that was recorded by Franklin, um, yeah, Franklin Roosevelt when Churchill was here in the early 1940s. Churchill said to Roosevelt, if the people knew how unnecessary this war is, they would hang us from the nearest tree. And Buchanan goes through, the, he goes through what it is, all of the things that could have been done, first of all, not to go to war, and secondly, and secondly, what, uh, what in fact was going on at other levels that no American ever perceived. No American ever perceived. For example, Hitler was being financed by the bank that John Foster Dulles and his brother Alan Dulles were chairman of the board and the executive director of in New York. For example, if you, look, if you were to look at Hitler's desk where he sat and did his work and so forth, the picture right up above the desk for his whole time was Thomas Watson, president of IBM creator of IBM. General Motors supplied Hitler with everything he needed until Roosevelt finally stopped them in 1942. The unnecessary war. But the question really gets down to that you can say not just what about Hitler, but what about you name the person just go to one country, any country at all, France or Romania and so forth, and they will all say, what about this one? What about that one who was attacking the, 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 the country, the nation state? And the answer is, where in the New Testament do you find that Jesus ever said that a follower of his can do in a crowd what they can't do alone? Where? 
more time. More. The, the problem is this. Jesus is not concerned about the survival of Rome. Rome is essentially trivial to Jesus. He doesn't address it. He doesn't care about it. Rome executes him with the help of the Jewish leaders. But he is not, his, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And therefore, how do you walk away from Jesus' teachings of nonviolent love of friends and enemies, which are right there on the page, which you are called to as a disciple, and go out and use violence to kill people, maim people in war, just because some human lump of clay like yourself says, they're the enemy, and now you've got to go kill them. It makes no difference whether it's Roosevelt or Churchill or Napoleon or Caesar or anyone else. Where is the authority for doing that? Well, the authority is my survival, my nation's survival. Well, as we said last night, no nation survives. Everyone, every nation goes like the blade of grass, dust, falls away. As far as the person is concerned, if you're really interested in survival, then you would not choose temporal survival over eternal survival. Jesus lists a way to eternal survival. He says it. Of your enemies, do good to aid you, pray for those, blah, 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 all that. We know. The cross. The cross is the road to eternal survival. The gun, whether in a, the cross turned upside down is the sword. And regardless of the motivation for using it, whether it's to defend the Croatia or Romania or whatever it is from this one or that one, that may be acceptable in conscience for people who were not called by Jesus. But there is no logical way to move from the teachings of Jesus and say, I am following them in the terms of murdering people and killing people to defend a piece of, a piece of dirt even to defend your own life, which Jesus didn't, and which Stephen didn't, and which the first 300 years of Christianity, and probably a lot more than that, but 300 years of Christianity didn't. Remember, the Roman Empire knew what the United States government knows, England knows, every government knows, and that is you want to control the adults, threaten the family. And the Roman Empire just didn't kill people, they killed families. And yet, that's what the Christians did. They would not part company with the eternal way uh, for what was going to perish anyway. But that came from Jesus. So that, that's a start. Anyway, what, yes, you were going to say. Who's the next? I'm like, he, Who, who's next? He right here. He had his hand up there. He David. He was ready to go. Thank you. All right. Uh, there was a woman caught in adultery. And she was being chased down and ready to be stoned. And Jesus interceded. What would he do for the one million people that were in the concentration camp about to be executed. He would positively, absolutely, for a, for a start, say, except the 3,500 of them that were, in the, that, that were in the ship St. Louis off the coast of uh, Florida, that Roosevelt, the United States government, said, those Jews can't come here, let them go. Secondly, secondly, the issue is never that one dies. Everyone dies. How we die can be painful, it can be easy, it can be in this situation or that situation. The issue is not how a person dies, the issue is death and what happens. And therefore, Stalin, Stalin killed 30 million people of his own people. Mao Zedong did the same thing. But before Hitler, before Mao Zedong, before Stalin, Christians in America did the same thing to American Indians. Massive genocide in terms of tens of millions of human beings. 
starting back with Cotton Mather in Massachusetts, who has some of the worst sermons you could ever imagine matched. I mean, it's, they're equal to anything a pope said in calling a crusade. But you can't justify wrongs with other the wrongs. You what? You can't justify wrongs with other wrongs. Not trying to do that. All I'm trying to say is it's, the issue is death, not the way people die. And therefore, it is appointed for all men once to die. And after death, judgment. And right. Therefore, the question becomes not how I die, but how I live. And therefore, to the extent that it's possible to follow the way of Jesus and interfere with someone being hurt or killed, stop it or interfere with it, or modify it, a Christian is absolutely bound to do that. Bound to do that. But no Christian has it within her Christianity or his Christianity the right to preserve physical life by a way that Jesus says is evil. That is not within the Christian's perspective. It might be within Hindus, Buddhists, Judists, Jew and therefore, all kinds of things are available to people. But because we are, as a people, Christians, since we are nurtured for hundreds and thousand plus years into our default position on everything being violence, we can't even think of an alternative. So let me give you an example. One of the great Christians of the 20th century, I mean great Christians, was Clarence Jordan. Clarence Jordan was a Baptist minister. He had a bachelor's degree in, in agriculture and a doctorate degree in Greek. And then in the 1940s, early 19, he, he founded Koinia Farms down in, uh, down in America's Georgia. And he, did, he, he saw this as... as as what God called him to do, because he said, where in America do I see the greatest of evils? And it was racism in the South. Southwest Georgia at, the, at this time, in the early 1940s, was Nazi America for black people. That's what it was. Now, so what does he do? He says, Jesus doesn't write papers on the subject. He goes and brings love to where there's evil. So he set up Koinia Farms, which is an integrated uh, black, white um, community, farming community, Christian, all Christian, and they began to live there. And of course, you all can imagine what happened. The burnings, the beatings, the, everything that went there. Now, they, they lived Christian lives. They lived in separate houses, and they lived in so forth. There was nothing, nothing like a hippie movement or anything like that. This, this was real Christian life. And Clarence was a brilliant man. But anyway, there's this story, there's, there's this piece that he's told. It's told. After he was there almost 10 years, and people were more and more disgusted with the whole thing. And remember, if America's is right, uh, is... Um, right next to Plains. Immediately, it attaches to Plains, Georgia, where Jimmy Carter was. Well, and, and Clarence had done all kinds of things. I mean, he had tried in all kinds of ways. For example, one Sunday, he brought to his Baptist church a black man to pray on Sunday. And the next, that very night, he got called by, I don't know who it is, the elders or whatever it is that run the church, and they called him down and they're going to throw him out of the church. And he asked them, he took out his Bible, and he put it in front of the first guy, and he said, right there, you show me what I did wrong. He went down the whole group of how many there were. And the last man said, Clarence, we don't care what's in the Bible. We don't want any niggers in our church. 
we don't care what's in the Bible. So, this is an event from Clarence's life that will shed something here. Remember to begin with, all people must die. The issue for the Christian is not dying, it's living. It's living. Christ comes to tell us the way to live, as he did up until his death. Okay. In the early 1950s, in Koenia Farms, life was hard. Crops were burned, all that stuff there. People were beaten. But one night, something happened. One Tuesday night, something happened that had never happened before. And that is, about midnight or so, three cars pulled into the place where the uh, housing was for the people, the families, and machine guns randomly the whole place. Just machine gunned it. Now remember where you're living in the terror those people are living on, and now you wear this. No one was killed, but they just missed being killed. You know? And so, the next day, you know and I know, and we all imagine the conversations that took place, and they're recorded. We've done this experiment in love long enough. Uh, th these people cannot be touched. You know, love doesn't touch them. You know, we got to get out of here. Our families are here, you know? Look, uh, the machine gun bullets, uh, they came close. They could have killed someone. And so they discussed it and so forth. And Clarence said, no, his, his point was, Jesus didn't run from evil. He confronted it with love. That's what we got to do. We got to pray. We got to love. Now, he went down to the, to the local papers and everything else and tried to explain to them. He went down to the pastors of all the churches in the area. And they all told him the same thing. You are responsible if anyone gets killed, because you're bringing the niggas in there. You. The next Thursday night, the same thing happened. Except this time, it was, it was even worse, the, the, the amount of machine gunning. And by this time, people just want to get out. And some did. And some did. But all the time, he's saying the same thing. We cannot respond to violence with violence. We have to respond with love. And we have to use our minds to figure out how to do this. And remember, there's no end to what grace can do if we rely on it, if we trust it. What are you going to do? You know, no one's helping them. No one. Well, anyway, what takes place is, the third Thursday afternoon, three white guys come up. And they want to see Clarence, and he walks out. And they say, they tell him what no one could know unless they were there, about what happened in the two previous weeks of the machine gunning. So he knows who they are. And they say to him, Jordan, if you don't get the niggas off the land tonight, the sun is not going to rise on this place in the morning. I don't know. It, the atmosphere had to be drenched with terror. These were just mean guys who meant business and who had been nurtured in that deeply. And it was a world where black people just disappeared. Lynchings were common practice. Southwest Georgia early 1950s. And so, Clarence, we heard them say it. Jordan, you don't get the niggas out of here. By tomorrow morning, the sun won't rise in this place. He, everyone knew what was being said. And Jordan said, boys, remember, he's a southerner. Southerner all his life. He knows that world. He says, boys, he said, they told me in seminary that there would be boys like you. There were possibly boys like you on the face of the earth, but I didn't believe them. He said, they told me in seminary there could be Christian boys like you. And I said, that's impossible. 
He said, they just told me in seminary that, that this was possible. And he said, to this second, I never believe him. He said, but let me, he said, shake your hand, he said, because I'm glad to meet three boys that can make the sun stand still. <laughs> they laughed. He saw a wedding ring on one of their fingers. And he said, they marry, yeah, do you have children? Yeah, how old? You know, that's a really, little kid. He, he said, look, he said, do you know what it is when you're up all night with a child, a little baby, and the baby's crying and crying and crying? You know, and then you're up all night with the baby, and then you've got to go to work the next morning. You know what kind of day it is for you? The guy said, oh, yeah, you're crazy. You're tired. You're exhausted. Now, he said, you know what it means? He said, you come home at night, and then for the next, whatever it is, nights, the baby's up, and you're up every night, and you're going to work every day, and you try to... He said, the guy said, oh, uh, you, you're, just, uh, you're just gone. People shouldn't be around you. You've got to do your work. But it's really, you're crazy if you stay up all those nights. You know? He said, well, look, he said, he said, we got a mom, he said, we got a, we got a mother and father in there. They have a little baby, new baby. The baby's been off and on up all night for the last five months. They hardly get any sleep. It's been going on week after week, month after month. The baby seems healthy, but just wakes up and starts crying. And, and they're up, and they're up, and they're, he said, they're, they're exhausted. Now he says, boys, he says, what do you want to come in here with those machine guns making all that noise, waking that baby up? <laughs> you know what it is that those parents have to get up. The hate never stopped, but there was never a machine gunning again, and no one was ever murdered. I say that because which one of us, faced with that situation as Jordan was, which one of us would have picked out the phrase, the sun won't come up here in the morning? to work with, which one of us would have seen the wedding ring on the finger and used it? What I'm saying here is people don't act in crisis situations any differently than they act day in and day out. As we have been nurtured, so we will respond in the crisis situation. If we are faithful in little things, then we'll be given bigger things. But you cannot be spending one's life having as your default position, well, I don't care what the Bible, Jesus says, the gospel says, I'll use violence, and then expect to be nonviolent in the crisis situation. That won't happen. Clarence Jordan, from the day he was in seminary, in fact, before he got into seminary, he writes about it. He knew Jesus was nonviolent, and that was his way. That love was the answer to evil, and this is what he was committed to. And everyone that came to that community was committed to that. And they prayed over that, and they prayed together over that. And they didn't just work for that in terms of the outside. That was Fundamentally, it was in terms of the group itself. And then when the crises came along, he had that answer. But suppose what he chose didn't affect the people the way he thought it was going to affect them, and they came back that night, and there was a mass murder. What better way to die than following the way of Jesus? What worse way to die than to abandon the way of Jesus to survive and then have your head blown off. And so it is, huh? And so it is, you and I can only do what we can do. Violence didn't stop the Holocaust. Violence didn't stop Hitler. Violence didn't stop Stalin or Mao Zedong. Violence didn't stop the, uh, the, the, the genocide of the American Indians. And we go on and on, huh? 
nor did violence stop anything that Caesar was doing in Jesus' time. Nor did Jesus stop it. He went up against it with love where he could do that. And then he called people to do the same where they could do it in time and space. So the Jewish people that say to us Christians, I don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Why? If Jesus is the Redeemer, why doesn't the world look more redeemed? Messiah is not a Hindu term or a Chinese term. It's a Jewish term. It's a Hebrew term. They know what Messiah is, and they know what the Messiah is to bring. Where's the redemption? Where's the world as it's supposed to be changed? And of course, we Christians give the glib answer from Chesterton. Oh, it's not that Christianity has been tried and failed. It's that it hasn't been tried because it's so hard. Ha ha. We're not talking ha ha. We're talking about salvation or not salvation. And so, and so indeed, I don't know what the response would have been to the Holocaust, if, but no response was given anyway, or any other form of violence. But what I do know is we will act in the crisis moment according to our chosen way of acting over a period of time. But... If we fail to act in the crisis moment as Jesus would have acted, then that's sin. That's sin. But the St. Basil said, you've fallen. Get up. The gospel, the good news is Jesus, Jesus forgives and forgives instantly if we but ask. But the minute you say, 